Okay, I want to talk about a topic um, that it may take me a couple of weeks to get through this, but, it, but not much longer than that. I want to talk about a scriptural view of wealth, how we should view wealth from a scriptural perspective. Now, unfortunately, there was a book that I was going to read something from, and it's, I, I, I fear that it is laying on my desk. Um, had it all outlined, highlighted and ready to go, and I think it's laying on my desk, so I might have to read that next week. But um, <clears throat> most of what you're going to learn from the world is not what the Bible teaches when it comes to wealth. The, the Bible teaches something different. Now, wealth can be considered material goods, and in the Bible, in certain aspects, it is. But there's more to it than that. And sometimes we get so wrapped up in the world's idea of what wealth is that some of the wealthiest people in this world don't realize how wealthy they are. And so being grateful for the wealth that they have, they're running after something that isn't really what they should be running after. Um, one of the things that we, that we need to take a look, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 12 because I want you to see that our view of wealth, how we define wealth affects our personal decisions. It affects how we spend time and money and how we plan for the future. In Luke chapter 12, verses 15 through 21, actually begin at verse 16. Luke 12, beginning at verse 16, and he spake a parable unto them, saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, this will I do, I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods, and I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, then whose shall those things be? which thou hast provided. You see, many times we look at things from a standpoint of trying to build wealth so that we can take a nap and relax, make enough money when we're young so that we can live our lives without having to lift a finger, and yet you don't know how long you're going to live. You know, God says that, that it, it, on an average, um, we have three score and 10, and if by reason of strength, four score, that's 70 to 80 years. On average, a lot of people work like a dog to, to get wealthy and die at 45 because they work like a dog to get wealthy, and that's all that they were considering, not anything else. Um, another thing is, and, and this is unfortunate, that our view of wealth sometimes determines how we judge people, how we look at other folks. Look at Psalm chapter 49. See, this isn't anything new. This is not 21st century just started happening. This, was going, this goes all the way back. Psalm chapter 49, <clears throat> verses 16 through 20. Be not thou afraid when one is made rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. Though while he liveth, he blessed his soul, and men will praise thee when thou doest well to thyself. He shall go to the generation of his fathers. They shall never see light. Man that is in honor and understandeth not is like the beasts that perish. You see, sometimes people judge folks by how wealthy they are. They look up to the people that are, that are self-made men. 
not understanding that most of those self-made men are about as wicked as you could possibly imagine. It is God, as I'm going to show you in a minute, it's God that makes people wealthy. And sometimes those of us are not the ones he chooses to be that type of wealthy. A child of God is wealthy in other senses, as we're going to see today. And that's where our view of wealth should be. Rather than looking at building up estates of silver and gold and real estate and all this other stuff, there are other treasures that a child of God should be concerned with. And if God then blesses you to have the other stuff, as he did Abraham and others, that's fine. But don't make that your total goal, because if you do, you're chasing after things the same way that the world does. Look at Proverbs chapter 19. And verse 4. Wealth maketh many friends, but the poor is separated from his neighbor. You see, the point being that people that are rich, everybody seems to want to be buddies with the guy that's got the dough. And the poor folks seem to get shoved off into the corner, even though they might be more righteous than the rich guy. Don't choose your friends based on who has more than someone else. That's irrelevant. That really ma doesn't matter. Look at Jeremiah chapter 44. Verses 15 through 25. Jeremiah 44, beginning at verse 15. <clears throat> And this is an interesting point. This, this, is, this happened at a time when uh, the children of Israel had drifted into idolatry. And then they decided to stop the idolatry things. Okay? Now watch what happens um, in verse 15. Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods... And all the women that stood by, a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt and Pathros, answered Jeremiah, saying, <clears throat> As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee, but we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth, to burn incense unto the queen of heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto her, as we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, for then had we plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil. You see what they're saying? Back in the days when we were sinning, we didn't have any problems. We had money to boot. We were in great shape back before we joined the church. Have you ever heard anybody say this? They joined the church and the next thing you know, they're in trouble. And they blame God for themselves being in trouble. Well, now watch what really caused it. Verse 18, but since we left off to burn incense, see, they joined the church the queen of heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. And when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings unto her without, without um, our men? See, they, they were doing fine. And then all of a sudden they, they do what God tells them to do and now they're struggling. Why is that? You ever, those of you that I have baptized, you probably remember I, I, I gave you a warning. Things are going to get rough for a while. Once you get through that, but there's a, there's a period of time when things get rough. Now watch what Jeremiah says here. Then Jeremiah said unto all the people, to the men and to the, wor and to the women, and to all the people which had given him that answer, saying, The incense that ye burned in the cities of Judah... And in the streets of Jerusalem, ye and your fathers, your kings and your princes, and the people of the land, did not the Lord remember them? 
and came it not into his mind all those years that you were doing all that other stuff? You don't think God noticed that? You don't think he remembers all the stuff you used to do before you woke up and got in the church? So that the Lord could no longer bear because of the evil of your doings and because of the abominations which ye have committed, therefore is your land a desolation and an astonishment and a curse without an inhabitant as at this day, because ye have burned incense and because ye have sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, nor walked in his law, nor in his statutes, nor in his testimonies. Therefore, this evil is happened unto you at this day. You see the point? I know this is a little far afield from our topic, but sometimes people are doing fine as long as they're living in the world. Then they join the church and things get rough for a while. And then if they stay, they come through it. If they don't stay and go back into the world like these did, well, they're back in the world again. The point is sometimes when you first are converted and join the church, expect it to be rough for a little while. You got some paying to do, folks. You did a lot of evil back in those days. Be ready for it. God will not be mocked. Whatever you sow, that shall ye also reap. And God's children pay for that in this life. Don't go back to doing the other stuff. So even though you might have made a boatload of money back in the old days, then you join the church and things get rough, don't think that the answer to that is to run back into the world again. That's not what you should be looking at, and that's not how you should judge wealth or anything else if you're a child of God. If you're, if you're not a child of God, then by all means, have at it. But if you are, that's not how you should divine wealth by how good things were before and how bad things were when you changed your mind. Um, look at Proverbs chapter 15. We're going to look at verses 17 and 27. Proverbs 15, 17, and 27. Verse 17 says, Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. You know, it's better to get by on bologna and cheese sandwiches than it is to have filet. Sometimes. If you can have bologna and cheese sandwiches in a situation where everybody loves each other and takes care of each other, you're better off than having that stalled ox, having the Rolls Royce sitting in the garage and everybody in your house being at each other's throats. It's better to get by with love and charity than it is to have all the material stuff and be like this. And I can't tell you how many families I've met over the course of my life that live like this. They butt horns constantly, and yet they spend all their time out trying to acquire wealth, material wealth, thinking somehow that's gonna make them happy. Not gonna make them happy, folks. It's not where happiness comes from, not at all. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24, Jesus says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where three thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where three thieves do not break through nor steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You see, the, a person's view of wealth reveals their, in many times their spiritual condition. 
if they're more concerned with gaining wealth than they are with gaining understanding in the scriptures, it's not a good sign. It's really because you're building your treasures here. Well, I'll be, I'm in my 70th year. My next birthday, I'll be 70 years old. Now, if we're granted three score and 10, I'm hitting the beginning of that, of that period of time. And, and I might get another 10 years out of this. And that's it. And 10 years goes by pretty quick. Think about this for a minute. This June, this church will be 10 years old. So those of you that were original members of this church, that's about how much time I've got left. Think back. And if I live to be 80 years old, which I think the only people in my family that have ever lived to be 80 were my grandparents, my, yeah, my grandparents on my dad's side. So. Think about it, you don't have, so what good is it to build up all this stuff to leave to somebody else? To just, if, if, that's where your, if that's where your vision is, if that's really all you're trying to do, wouldn't you be better off just being obedient to God? Because I'm, I'm gonna show you another verse in a couple of minutes that, that um, that's gonna contrary this whole idea of trying to establish wealth being nothing but dollars and cents, okay? Um, look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. <clears throat> Verses 9 through 10. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drowned men in destruction and perdition for the love of money. Notice this, it's not the money, it's the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. If God decides to make somebody wealthy in a material sense, that's fine if God does it. But if all you're, if you're consumed with it, if you love money so much that that's your ultimate goal in living life, pay attention to those verses. And I'm gonna show you some of the reasons why in just a second. In Matthew chapter six, and this is where I was going to read the, the, out of that book. Um, Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 and 32. We read, therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Who are the Gentiles? Well, in Christ's day, they were the heathen. You see, this idea that we, the, the way that we view wealth for the most part in the 21st century in the United States of America is downright heathen. It's not scriptural, it's downright heathen. For all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. God knows that you need a roof over your head. He knows that you need a method of transportation. He, need, he knows you need clothes. He knows you need food. He's aware of that. Now, let me ask a question. If you knew and truly believed that you didn't have to worry about any of that stuff, that God would make sure that you had a roof over your head, that you had a car to drive, that there was gas to put in the car, that you had a job that you could work at, that you'd always have food on the table, that you'd always be clothed. If you truly believed that, that God would do that and all you have to do is be obedient to him, would you be obedient to him? If you believed it, you probably would, right? If you really believe that God would see you through this mess, why not? And the only rule is be obedient. 
why would you not be obedient to him? Make sense? Look at the next verse. Verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now that's a promise from God. You be obedient to God to the limits of the life that you have, and you're not going to have to worry about whether you got a roof over your head or not. <clears throat> you may not be living in the Taj Mahal, but at least you got a roof. You'll, have, you'll be able to get around. You'll have clothes to wear. You may not be wearing Armani suits, but you'll still be clothed. Why wouldn't someone do that? That's the only catch. It's the whole catch, and God will see you through somehow. But the idea of running after and searching after wealth in a material sense, like most people do in this day, it's, 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 that's a heathen position. <clears throat> now, let's look at some, define some terms. The word wealth, you look this up in the Oxford English Dictionary. The word wealth, the primary meaning of that word is the condition of being happy and prosperous. Happy and prosperous. You know how many wealthy people I know that aren't happy? Why aren't they happy? Because they want more wealth. They might have wealth, but that ain't enough. I need more wealth because the wealth I got didn't make me happy. You know, there's a, there's a line from a former president, and I don't usually quote him that much, but Abraham Lincoln said something one time, and it's really true. Most people are about as happy as they make up their minds to be. You can be happy with nothing. Sometimes you're happier with nothing than Chase been being on that proverbial hamster wheel, running and running and running and running and running and running and running without ever getting anywhere. So the condition of being happy and prosperous. The second um, definition is spiritual well-being. You got to get all the way down to three before you get to prosperity consisting in the abundance of possessions. Worldly goods, valuable possessions, especially in great abundance, riches of affluence. That's the th third definition, not the primary. The primary is the condition of being happy and prosperous. The word prosperous means having continued success or good fortune, consistently successful, flourishing, thriving, it mentions here success, success that which happens in the sequel, the termination, favorable or otherwise, of affairs, the issue, upshot, result, good success, the prosperous achievement of something attempted, the attainment of an object according to one's desire. Good fortune means good luck, success, prosperity, well-being, the state of being or doing well in life, happy, healthy, or prosperous condition, moral or physical welfare. You see how sometimes being prosperous, it means the, and being successful means attaining whatever the goal was that you were seeking for. Doesn't necessarily mean monetarily. I know people, I have, a, I have friends that you would look at and say, well, that guy's not very successful, right? Because he decided at a young age to be a musician. And there's not a lot of money in being a musician if, you're, if you don't make it famous. And yet he's happy. To him, he's prosperous. He's, to him, he's wealthy, even though most people would look at him and, and not think, think, think so much. But that's what it, those were his goals, and he's achieved them. He's gotten to where he wanted to be. There are a lot of people in the arts that don't become wealthy in the sense of material wealth, and yet they've, they've spent their whole life working towards something and have finally attained it in the type of artwork that they do, photographers and painters and 
all, there's all kinds of fields where, you know what, it used to, there used to be a time when professors didn't make that much and yet they spent their entire life trying to learn more and more and more so that they could be better as a professor. And they were wealthy in that sense. So it's not always the way we look at it so many times today as money. Um, now, treasure does mean wealth or riches stored or accumulated, especially in the form of precious metals, gold, silver, coin, hence in, in general money. So there is a sense in which wealth does refer to that. Revenue is a return to a place, the return yield or profit of any lands, property, or a other important source of income. So the, the definition of the word wealth in both English and Hebrew shows that wealth involves more than an abundance of material possessions and therefore is not limited to an abundance of material possessions. It just simply isn't. So in other words, by definition, one may be wealthy that doesn't have an abundance of material possessions. If they're happy, if they're successful in whatever it is that they're striving to, to reach. Um, and since being prosperous is having continued success, and since success is the achievement of something attempted or the attainment of something desired, being prosperous depends on what our goals are. If your goal is to be something other than material wealth and you reach that goal, are you not successful in it? I remember a while back when Josh's goal was to pass calculus because that many would get a degree. And he worked his tail off to pass calculus. And he did. He was successful in that. Now it didn't pay him anything. I don't think he got a check, but he was successful in it. He reached for the goal. He attained the goal. And in doing so doing, he became wealthy in that. So you see, by definition, a poor man could be wealthy, could be prosperous, could be successful and in most cases is going to be happier than the people that chase after the almighty dollar. Another interesting thing about the Hebrew word is that the Hebrew word for wealth also entails virtue and that's character. To build character is to be wealthy, is to be prosperous, is to be successful. This, this broader view of prosper, prosperity is, is clearly seen over in, in 3 John, verse 2. <clears throat> Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. I can, you know, I keep, I, I hate to keep pointing at me, but um, there was a time when I could get through the day without having to carry two inhalers around with me, where I didn't wake up in the morning and my bones ached, when I was in really good health. And I would give all the wealth in the world to be in really good health as opposed to worrying about how much money's in the bank. That's something you can't buy, folks. There are things that are more important in this life than material stuff. I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. That word even as means exactly 
precisely, just as, in the same way, true prosperity accords with the prosperity of the soul. If you prosper and are in health, even as your soul prospers, what would your condition be? May not matter if you got any money in the bank or not. Now, Scripture clearly presents a view of wealth that extends beyond the abundance of material possessions um, so that one may be wealthy in the scriptural sense while being poor in material possessions. may not have a whole lot of money in the bank, but you can still be considered wealthy. Now, Scripture does indeed speak of wealth and riches in terms of material possessions. Let's not... It does. It most definitely does. Look at, um, you don't need to turn here. I'll just read these for you. Over in Genesis chapter 13 and verse 2, it says that Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. How did Abraham become rich? <clears throat> God made him rich. In Joshua 22 and verse 8, as the children of Israel were dividing the land that the Lord had given him, Joshua said, Return with much riches unto your tents, and with very much cattle, with silver, and with gold, and with brass, and with iron, and with much raiment. So there is a sense in which riches, the scripture does teach of riches. Um, you can get it. Her pen just exploded right there on the spot. <laughs> Over in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, it says that Hezekiah, <clears throat> verses 27 through 29, Hezekiah had exceeding much riches and honor, and he made himself treasuries for silver and for gold and for precious stones and for spices and for shields and for all manner of pleasant jewels, storehouses also for the increase of corn and wine and oil, and stalls for all manner of beasts, and coats for flocks. Moreover, he provided him cities and possessions of flocks and herds in abundance, for God had given him substance very much. <clears throat> and this is the important part we need to remember. If God blesses you to be wealthy in material aspects, don't ever lose sight of where this came from and don't ever decide that that's going to be where you're going to put your faith <clears throat> we're going to see this in that you know what that stuff will go away you start thinking i got plenty of gold and plenty of silver and plenty of money in the bank and it can leave overnight don't ever do that you put your faith in god if God makes you wealthy, great. If he doesn't make you wealthy in material things, he may make you wealthy in something else. There was a time when, when Ishmael, this is not Abraham's son Ishmael, but that was a fairly common name. Uh, he'd gone on a rant, and he was killing people left and right. And, and, uh, and we read over in Jeremiah chapter 41 and verse 8, but ten men were found among them that said unto Ishmael, Slay us not, for we have treasures in the field of wheat and of barley and of oil and of honey. So he forbear and slew them not according to their brethren. So you see, the scripture does teach that sometimes wealth is dealing with material things. Um, when we, we talk about Jesus and the wise men, when they came to the, to the house, over in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 11, it says, And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. I want you to notice that the type of wealth, when we're talking about material things, the type of wealth that, that the scripture talks about being wealth is substantial. 
It can be weighed. It can be stored. It can be used to eat or to wear or to make things for other uses. This kind of wealth is not fiat wealth like what we have in our banking system. This is wealth that like gold and silver and, and cattle and things that can be used that are useful other than a worthless piece of paper that somebody says is worth something. You, you, I, I was reading an, an article, I think, by Elon Musk, the, the, the Tesla guy. Um, and in this article, he pointed out that right now they say that our national debt is somewhere around $30 trillion here in the U.S. But in reality, it's closer to $100 trillion when you consider all of the um, entitlements that are future that have to be paid. And that in every, every time that anyone has ever gotten into this situation, the economy is completely collapsed and all of that fiat money you got ain't worth nothing. You might as well blow your nose on it. But trying to accomplish something by building that kind of wealth you know, we've seen it happen in markets before. What was it, 2008, when the real estate market collapsed and people lost how much? And we could be heading in that direction again. So, folks, don't put your heart in what looks like wealth if it's not really what the Bible defines as wealth because that stuff can go away tomorrow. And over in Proverbs chapter 23, I made mention of this earlier. Now I'm going to show you the verse. Don't ever put your trust in the money you got in the bank. Or even what you got in the safe at home. Don't put your faith there. Don't think that that's what's going to get me through the hard times. Proverbs chapter 23, verses 4 and 5 says, labor not to be rich, cease from thine own wisdom. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. I can tell you a number of times that people have put all of their trust and faith in what they got in the bank. And poof, it's gone. You know, think, think back to the stock market crash back in 1929 and the number of people that jumped off of skyscrapers because in, in a matter of moments, everything that they had that they'd hoped for was gone. That kind of stuff can go away immediately. And if you put your trust and faith in that, now it's nice. I have, look, Wendy and I, we have savings. It's prudent to have savings, but that's not where my trust lies. My trust lies in God. That's what's going to get me through the tough times, not the savings. That's for the kids. Hopefully they'll get it someday. But you see, the, our trust should be there rather than in, in our own material stuff. Over in Matthew chapter 6, In verse 19, we already saw this. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. And in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 17, I think this is a different one from what we saw just a minute ago. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Don't put your trust in Federal Reserve notes or whatever they're called.
So that's not to be trusted to secure the future. Over in Psalm, chapter 62, in verse 10, Trust not in oppression, and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. And in Psalm chapter 52 and verse 7, we read, Lo, this is the man that made not God his strength. You see, you can trust in riches. If you trust in your riches, you're not trusting in God. And this is the man that doesn't trust in God. Watch what it says about him but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened him himself in his wickedness. Wicked people trust in what they got in the bank, so don't trust in what you got in the bank. Trust in God, and God will get you through it. In Proverbs 11, In verse 28, says, He that trusteth in his riches shall fall, but the righteous shall flourish as a branch. We're also told over in Mark chapter 10 and verse 24 that, that it's, it's, it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's easier for a camel to walk through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Placing one's hope and confidence in material wealth is also classed with idolatry. Look at Job chapter 31. Twenty-four through twenty-eight. Job thirty-one, twenty-four through twenty-eight. If I have made gold my hope, or have said to the fine gold, Thou art my confidence. If I rejoiced because my wealth was great, and because mine hand had gotten much. If I beheld the sun when it shined, or the moon walking in brightness, and my heart hath been secretly enticed, or my mouth hath kissed my hand, this also were an iniquity to be punished by the judge, for I should have denied the God that is above. So if God blesses you and makes you wealthy in material goods, then thank God for it, but don't look at those material goods as, the, as what's gonna get you through this, because whatever comes our way may wipe out that, those material goods like that. And if it happens, What are you going to trust in then? If you put all your trust in all that and that becomes dung, then where's your trust going to go? If you hadn't been trusting in God all along and that was there, okay, that's fine. God will see you through because he saw you through to get you that to begin with. But folks, the money that we've got could turn into toilet paper in about 15 minutes. And based on what's going on in Washington today, that could very well happen in a short period of time. Don't put your faith in that. Put your faith in God. Now, Scripture also speaks I don't know if I can get through all of this before. Well, I'll get into a little of it. Scripture also speaks of wealth and riches extending beyond material possessions. In Genesis chapter 15, in 
and verse 1. It says, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Which is better, to have a pile of money in a safe or to have God? Which one's going to get you through this? To have pounds and pounds of gold stored by your house, by your side, or to have God as your shield and great reward? Which one's better? Look at Psalm 16. Verses 5 and 6. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. Who wrote that? King David? King David? Do you suppose King David had any wealth and senses of material goods? Yeah, he was kind of like the king of Israel who lived in a palace. He had plenty of material wealth and yet look what he said. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance. Not his money, the Lord. And of my cup thou maintainest my lot. Look at, at uh, Psalm 23 and verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Over in Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 7. Ephesians 2 and verse 7. Paul says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Notice riches, the riches of his grace. Is that not valuable? Is the riches of God's grace, is that not more valuable than a safe full of gold? You can have a safe full of gold and spend eternity in hell, folks. Which is more valuable? All the gold in Fort Knox, which there probably isn't any, any anymore, or the riches of God's grace, which is more important. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 8, we read, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this, grave, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. You see, that's wealth worth having. That's wealth that will get you through whatever is coming your way, much more so than, than the bottom line on a P&L statement. In Colossians chapter 2, In verse 2, that their hearts might be comforted, be knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. You know how you build up faith? 
Well, part of it is walking and watching how God takes care of you when you're walking in obedience with him. What, what else comes from that? What else comes from walking in obedience? Further understanding. The more understanding you have, the more obedient you are, the more understanding you get. The more understanding you get, the more faith you get. The more experience that you get, the more you see how God has taken care of you and led you through all of the experiences that you've had in your life. Folks, that's worth a lot more than a safe full of dollar bills that could end up being worthless overnight. How do you get it? Well, you be obedient. You do what God tells you to do. And over a period of years, you become prosperous in it. You become wealthy in it, much more so than in terms of dollars and cents. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 3, we read, In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You see, wisdom and knowledge, those are treasures. Those are wealth. And in Proverbs chapter 8, And verse 18 says, Riches and honor are with me, yea, durable riches and righteousness. You see, these are durable. That means they're going to last. That means they're not just going to fly away someday. Having understanding is durable, something that will last. Those are riches that will last. Wisdom and knowledge. In 1 Thessalonians, chapter 3 and verse 12, <clears throat> we read, And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3, we read, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you toward, all, uh, uh, toward each other aboundeth. You see, there's wealth in love or charity. To abound in means to be plentiful, to be wealthy, to be copious in, to possess to a marked extent, so as to be characterized by, to have wealth of, having a wealth of charity is worth much more than having wealth in fiat currency. Because charity builds and binds relationships. And those are a source of wealth. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 1. Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. It's okay to know stuff, but if all you do is know stuff and you don't care about anything other than just knowing stuff and you don't care about other people, all that does is make you pound your chest. Charity builds. Love builds. It builds relationships. It builds congregations. And that's worth something. That's wealth. In Colossians chapter 3,
and verse 14. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Compare this with Philippians chapter 4 and verse 1. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. You see the charity here? You see the love? This is an apostle writing to members of a church. He cares about these. Is that not worth something? Of course it is. To have an apostle that thinks of you, to have a minister that thinks of you, that prays for you, that takes care of you if, when needs arise, is that not wealth? And the only reason that that happens is because God steps in and has it happen. Again, that's coming from him. You can also be rich in good works. We're told that over in 1 Timothy chapter 6. In verse 18, the Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day and in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus thou knowest very well. I'm sorry, that's 2 Timothy. 1 Timothy 6, 18. Try that one. Who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man hath seen nor can see to whom be honor and power Everlasting amen. And there's being rich in faith. James chapter 2 and verse 5. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him. You see, a poor man can be rich in faith. And actually, poor folk usually have more faith than wealthy do. Wealthy tend to think about what they got in the, in the bank. It's human nature to do that. Poor folk don't have that choice. Poor people that live from day to day are some of the richest in faith that you'll ever find because that's really all they've got. They have to step out in faith every day in order to get by. And they trust God many times much more than those that are wealthy in material goods and that's why they grow. That's why they have more understanding. That's why sometimes they're the strongest members in a church, the ones that are poor. So you don't have to be wealthy to be rich in faith. This is a pretty good place for me to stop for this morning. So I'm going to, and we're going to go ahead and take communion here in a moment. Um, with that, I'll, I'll, Lord willing, I'll pick this up and finish this study next week. Um, let's, uh, let's stand and we'll dismiss this portion of the, of the sermon and then we'll, 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 do commun we'll have the communion afterwards.